Welcome back, this is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. Today we're going to talk about a very important topic called toxic mold. There is a subset of patients out there who suffer on a daily basis and they don't get the help they need because it's often largely neglected by the medical community. So let's get right into what toxic mold is. So, <clears throat> mold will produce spores. And spores are not poisonous, but it can trigger an allergic reaction. So it can trigger things like asthma, sinus issues, rhinitis, okay? There's something called microtoxins mold can produce. And this is poisonous and causes serious illness in the patient. Only various species of mold will produce microtoxin. So not all mold species will produce microtoxins. They might just produce spores. So microtoxins are the ones that really cause a huge amount of damage in the biological system. Mold is visible, right? You can see the mold, let's say like this. If you have mold spores or black mold, you can see it on sometimes on the a ceiling tile or the wall or in the bathroom. So mold can grow and you can visibly see it. What you cannot see is the microtoxins and the spores that are in the air. It's not visible and sometimes it can be odorless. So you don't really smell the spores nor the microtoxin. You can smell maybe the dampness of a room. Okay, Toxic mold. What type of species? Stachybotrys is one, Cladosporium, Fusium, Penicillium, and Aspergillus. There's over 160 species of Aspergillus, but approximately 16 of them produce microtoxins. Okay. <clears throat> what are some of the mold spores that people are allergic to? I listed a bunch of them here. And I'll list some more in the description below the video, okay? Now, let's get into how you can be exposed to mycotoxins. You can get dietary mycotoxins from dry fruits, nuts, seeds, grains, corn, cereal, cured meat, aged cheese, and even coffee beans. So anything that is stored in a container or a silo right, and it's, it's dried and is contained in a, in a can, can create microtoxins over time. So any stored products like these can create microtoxin toxicity in people, okay. Airborne microtoxins, and this is what, what most people think about when they think about mold toxins. So you can have an HVAC unit that's full of mold. You can have water damage, either from a leaking pipe or a flood or a roof that is leaking and you don't even know it, right? There could be some aspect of the roof that leaks behind the walls and creates black mold or stachybotrys or penicillium or aspergillus in the back of the wall, constantly producing microtoxins. You want to keep the basement humidity way below 50%. So, the humidity over time can also create mold toxins uh, because the mold uh, thrives in the environment of humidity. So this is going to be a multi-part series on mold because it's a pretty complicated topic. There are a lot of people who suffer from it and there's many aspects of how to, one, diagnose somebody who has it, how do you treat it, Right? How do you get somebody out of the environment, which is really the number one thing to do, especially if there's mold toxins in the house, right? You have to get out of that environment. So these people who have true mycotoxin um, issues with their health, they are the ones who really suffer because oftentimes they get sick, they don't know why they're sick, they end up going to the doctors, they get prescribed medications that are useless for microtoxins. Um, they get, uh, they lose their job because they can't function anymore, 
right? Once they lose their job, how can they move, right? They're stuck in an environment that's toxic to them. And financially, it's just devastating for some people. So we're gonna discuss some of this and how we test for it, how we can manage some of these patients who are really chronic with mold toxicity, all right? My name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. And we'll see you guys next week on the healthy side. Have an awesome day.